What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of the Dolphins and Death Podcast. I'm Daniel Yafusi. Thanks so much for tuning in. Quick reminder before we start, make sure to subscribe to the Miami Herald YouTube page, like, share, comment, all that good stuff, as well as subscribe to the Miami Herald. All right, I'm running solo today. No David Neal on this week's episode, but we got a lot to talk about. Uh, the Dolphins as well as uh, the other higher-ups, big decision-makers all across the league. They're out in Phoenix for this week's owners' meetings, uh, a lot of business being done with a lot of uh, big names across the NFL uh, uh, congregating in one place, I should say. Uh, Mike McDaniel speaking to reporters out there on uh, Monday morning, and he got into a lot of uh, a lot of news um, with um, the Dolphins' recent moves these past uh, weeks, um, including acquiring Jalen Ramsey, um, signing a few free agents, losing a free agents. He got into all of that and more. So I want to spend the first time really diving into that uh, with my three big takeaways from Mike McDaniel at the owners meeting. I think number one is uh, I think really the biggest news to come um, out of, you know, Mike McDaniel's session with the reporters out there is that uh, there will in fact be a quarterback competition for the backup spots, the backup spot behind Tua Tungvaluwa. We all know that Miami signed uh, Mike White from the uh, from the New York Jets to a two-year deal, uh, bringing the Pembroke Bonds native back home. Um, and, and he did say, in fact, um, that Mike White will compete with Skylar Thompson to decide who backs up Tua Tungvaluwa. Now, I don't think this is a big surprise because if you remember – Back at the combine, Mike McDaniel said uh, he wanted to bring competition um, to the quarterback room for that backup spot. Obviously, excuse me, obviously, Mike White comes as a more experienced option, having started uh, about seven games in the past two years. Uh, but nonetheless, um, he, he said he was really excited. Um, said he reminds him about Matt Schaub, uh, reminds him of Matt Schaub, who he coached uh, back in his days with the Texans. I want to read the entire quote for you all that may not have seen it. Uh, Mike McDaniel said, I'm really pumped about Mike White. There's a lot of things his, that in his game that kind of reminded me of a player that I'd worked with in the past, uh, that when I left Houston, he was playing at a super high level, Matt Schaub. It's a situation that will be a competition, and I really believe in both players. And I think that benefits the team. I think that benefits the players in general. If you're going into something with the idea to compete, I think ultimately between the two of those guys, the goal is to have competition, produce for the Miami Dolphins, number two quarterback, uh, that can win games with the number one. Since the test of time, competition has only helped competitors and players in terms of development. So really pumped about that opportunity to have him and really like that room as we have it, as it stands right now. He also spoke about Tua um, and his offseason, uh, I guess, offseason regimen. Um, we all know that he's engaging in jujitsu, judo to kind of work on the way that he falls, to kind of work on the way his body reacts to some of these hits when he's falling down. So we can try to avoid um, these future head injuries. And he said that he's heard tremendous things about the process progress that Tua has made. He said Tua is in a really good spot. So obviously, that's really great news for the Dolphins uh, as it pertains to QB1. We all know um, that they view him as the QB of the future. They've exercised his uh, fifth-year option. Uh, so he's expected to be around for the next two years at least. He's under contract for the next two years, I should say, as they uh, uh, decide and look at their long-term options with him. But but getting back to the backup uh, situation, um, again, it's going to be a competition between Mike White and Skylar Thompson. Um, I, 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 we've talked about it before, but I thought the signing of Mike White was an interesting one um, because I don't, I don't think he was necessarily – the most sought after the 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 biggest name backup quarterback available um but you know he did come fairly cheap two years eight million eight million dollars um about the going rate for you know a backup quarterback these days um this past season with new york wasn't all that great um but he was playing through a rib injury um you know obviously we know about the dysfunction that the jets had um, as well as some some other injuries to his supporting cast. So maybe it wasn't the best environment for him, um, but there is familiarity. I've said that before. He knows the system. It's pretty much the exact same Shanahan-style system that a lot of uh, teams, including the Dolphins, are running. So they kind of lessens the learning curve. I, I will, I, I'm really interested to see how they kind of go about it because I'm not sure if we've, we've had a legitimate, um, you know, QB competition in some time um, in, in Miami and, you know, for, for the backup position, this is going to be really important. I'm um, just giving to his uh, injury history. Um, you know, I think both of these guys are quarterbacks who, you know, they, they, they're not necessarily tools guys, you know, they don't have huge arms, maybe not the most accurate guys 
out there. Um, but I think that they, I think Skyler and Mike White can can run the the offense um, pretty well within you know the, the limits of what they can do in terms of passing the ball. Um, I like Skylar Thompson's upside in terms of, you know, being able to run. Um, I was even saying a lot of times, especially during uh, that end, that uh, season ending loss to the Bills in the wildcard round, I was curious why Skylar Thompson didn't use his legs more. I thought that was something that, you know, he used to his, to a lot of success in Kansas state, maybe not as much in the NFL, um, but again, um, it, it's a tough spot when you're a seventh round, seventh uh, round rookie. Um, you're not expected to play at all. Injuries kind of throw you into the lineup where you, you don't have a lot of uh, practice reps. I think year two in the system, we've seen over the years, whether it's the 49ers, or the Rams, or a lot of other teams that use this uh, this type of scheme, this type of offense. We've seen year two is when the offense really, really, you know, excels. And, you know, I think that, that could this could be a year where we see a big jump not only from two in the offense, but, you know, um, you know through OTAs, through training camp, a guy like Skylar Thompson, who has a year two and, um, you know, he's probably going to be, he's going to be splitting those, those backup reps during uh, the spring and the summer with Mike White. But I think that there's a, there's a real opportunity there for him to uh, really improve. He had some good moments. I think he needs to take care of the ball a little more, make a little bit, make some better decisions, which I think is kind of the knock on Mike White at times as well. You know, he doesn't push the ball down the field, but uh, you know, he still turns the ball over a lot. Um, so, you know, that I think that's really interesting that this is definitely going to be an all right competition and that's something uh, definitely we're going to be keeping an eye on uh, with the Dolphins as they start their offseason workout program in a couple of weeks in mid-April. Second thing that stood out to me was uh, Mike McDaniel's comments on the running back situation. That was um, an interesting move for Miami to, to re-sign all four running backs that were slated to hit free agency. So we're talking about Raheem Mostert, Jeff Wilson Jr., Miles Gaskin, as well as Saban Ahmed. Um, you know, there were some rumblings, some rumors, some reports. Um, that the Dolphins did look into some bigger name options. There were some, 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 some starting caliber running backs um, from other teams that were that hit free agency, but the Dolphins ultimately uh, decided to sign um, uh, their group of running backs that they were that they knew that they were comfortable with. Um, signing Raheem Mostert and Jeff Wilson to two year deals, and Savannah Ackman and Miles Gaskin got one year deals. Um, and I think this is the first time we've really, really heard Mike McDaniel um, come out and say, like, the, the running backs are not the problem. Um, he, I think he, he made that very clear at the owners' meetings. If I can bring up this quote uh, as well or kind of give you uh, a, a portion of it, um, Mike McDaniel uh, was asked specifically, you know, was there any consideration to make a bigger move at running back? And what do you like about the continuity of the room? And Mike said, uh, if you take a look at the whole class, and ultimately we have the opportunity to bring in two of our strongest character contributors and really players we depend on in Raheem and Jeff. Um, they're both above 4.7 yards. Uh, carry. And when I look at the tape, I think there'd be a little bit of a different feeling if, and then he says, if we didn't run the ball, not because we didn't run the ball well, we didn't run the ball well in games that we were overly injured or some games, I just didn't call enough runs. And he went on to say, like, if you're getting a running back, and in this case, two running backs who are averaging 4.5 yards per carry, they're doing something really good. And he emphasized that he thinks that uh, Raheem and Jeff specifically are playing the best ball of their careers. Uh, and, and I tend to agree with, I tend to agree with that. You know, I, I think that um, we talked a lot about kind of the value of the running back position. It's a position where you can get a lot of production, but maybe you don't need to invest significant, significant resources. Uh, now, again, the Dolphins were middle of the pack in rushing um, average this past season. I believe they were tied for 18th at 4.3 yards per carry. Um, but if, if you really kind of look into that, um, there were a lot of negative yards, um, you know, early in the year, Chase Edmonds um, didn't really, um, you know, uh, acclimate to the, to the system very well. And they ended up trading him to Denver. Um, but in the second half of the season, I keep on saying, uh, saying this, you had a lot of really strong performances, maybe not, you know, all linked together, you know, game by game, um, whether it was the Browns game, whether it was the Bills game, when Raheem Mostert really picked up the load by himself. Um, but you saw that there, there was a lot of potential. I think, again, as I said before, I think these, these guys ran really hard. I think that you can get very, very good production for them in the construct of the offense, an offense that is, is going to be geared toward getting the ball to Tyree Kill and uh, Jalen Waddle. I think they make for really, really good uh, complementary pieces. So, um, I, again, I think this is one of the first times where Mike McDaniel, we've really heard Mike McDaniel come out and say, the problem is not the running backs. We need to run it a little bit more. 
Um, and again, I, I think that we'll see that in 2023, uh, where in some situations, especially those short yard situations, uh, they lean on that running game more. Um, and, and it's, again, for me, and I'm sure, and, and I, I, I'm i not even sure I know because Mike McDaniel has said it, um, it's not necessarily about like running 40 times a game or running times a game. It's about getting that efficiency and getting that production when you do decide to run. Um, and that kind of brings me to the last uh, takeaway from uh, the owners meeting in Mike McDaniel's session with uh, some reporters out there. Um, is the offensive line. Um, I know that this is always uh, a big point of contention with Dolphins fans. They always want to upgrade the offense. They want to make sure that uh, the trenches are secured. And to this point, the Dolphins haven't really done that much. They've only signed with one outside um, player, that being Dan Feeney from the uh, the, the New York Jets, um, uh, versatile interior offensive lineman, but not a bona fide starter. They also re-signed Kendall Lamb, Deron Christian, but again, no significant moves. We saw some other big name offensive linemen get some significant deals. And Mike McDaniel was, again, asked about that. I want, want to bring up his quote again from his time there uh, at the owner's meeting where he said, um, you know, what is the plan at offensive line? Uh, Mike says, um, we always have plans. There's opportunity cost for everything. Uh, he said, I think one of the things in regards to the offensive line is that, of course, you're always going to want to upgrade every position in this particular circumstance with the offensive line. Um, I do think it's important to upgrade the position for us with talent, but do we want to spend 12 to $20 million to do that? Is that the best way to spend our money? Um, and, and he goes on to say that in the Dolphin circumstance, they really want to improve uh, internally. They believe that they have some talent, they have guys with potential. Um, so they're definitely looking and trying to survey the market and see what happens there but they're also confident with the guys that they have um internally and i think that again that that follows a, a similar core and, and similar messaging um from chris greer at the um, the scouting combine in indianapolis um back in february march um when he said that you know they they do feel they're still very bullish on Liam Eichenberg and Austin that specifically. I think that at this point, those are the only two question marks in the offensive line. Jerron Armstead has been healthy, the Pro Bowl caliber left uh, left tackle. Connor Williams has shown that he can be a really good center. Robert Hunt, a really good right guard. But those two spots, right tackle and left guard, um, are still, you know, still question marks. Um, and it's clear that the Dolphins did survey the market, but, you know, uh, when kind of – I think the opportunity – opportunity cost statement was one that stood out because you get the salary cap you have the way where to invest your money um and it was clear that you know that that big move for Jalen Ramsey was going to be uh you know came up an opportunity arose arise, arisen is that the word is that what you said uh, it came about and um that became a priority for them and afterward um they, they had to look in you know how do they want to you know um effectively use their money um, so, you know, I, I think that there definitely will be, um, addition and a, a, I'll say additions, plural, because right now I, I don't think that this depth is going to cut it at all. Um, so I think that there definitely will be, will be depth. Um, I think, as I've been saying before, I think Dan Feeney is a guy that could potentially push the left guard. Um, he has experience at center. So is there a possibility of putting him at center and moving, um, Connor Williams to left guard? I don't know. I think that that's definitely something I'll be looking out for when we get to uh, OTAs and training camp. Uh, but I think that there definitely will be additions. It's just kind of a matter of um, surveying the landscape. And one thing I want to note is that, you know, we keep on kind of forgetting in these discussions that the Dolphins have $13.4 million that's coming to them um, after June 1st. That's coming from the release of Byron Jones, which was um, given a post June one designation. So the money won't be available till then. Um, you know, there's going to be a, a lot of offensive line and a lot of players that get released around that time, you know, especially as we transition into, into a uh, training camp, a lot of, a lot of releases, a lot of cuts and whatnot. Um, I think the Dolphins will definitely be active after where they're going to use some of that money to bring, maybe bring in a player or two and, uh, save that for during the season. Um, but I, I don't think the Dolphins are done making moves by, by any means. All right. We're going to take a short break, uh, but when we come back on the other side of things, uh, we got over under totals for the 2023 season already. The Dolphins, uh, they, they got an interesting number for the amount of wins that Vegas thinks they're going to get. Or I'm going to give my thoughts on that and a little bit more on the other side of things. So stay locked with us. What's going on, everybody? Still here on the Dolphins and that podcast talking all things Dolphins. Now, in the first half, I gave some thoughts on uh, the owners' meetings, which are taking place this week uh, in Phoenix. Um, I want to kind of look ahead 
um, you know, starting to get kind of to a kind of into a dead period, uh, so to speak. Uh, got us still a couple of weeks away from uh, the start of um, offseason workout programs. We're a month away from uh, the NFL draft, but uh, something caught my eye over uh, you know, past couple of days um, that I was kind of looking into, want to get my thoughts on. Um, Caesar Sportsbooks came out with uh, um, over under win totals for every team in the NFL. Um, I kind of want to scroll through it, see uh, what Vegas thought about the Dolphins, uh, you know, projections and prospects um, after, uh, you know, some big moves in the offseason. Um, I was kind of a little bit surprised uh, by this. They had the Dolphins over under at nine and a half wins. Um, obviously, the Dolphins finished nine and eight this past season, um, reached the playoffs for the first time since 2016, where we all know they uh, bowed out to the Buffalo Bills in the wildcard round. Now, 9.5 wins is uh, tied for fifth, the fifth highest over under win total in the AFC. Um, Dolphins are tied with the Jaguars, the Jets, and the Chargers for fifth among AFC teams. Um, the rest of the, the top four, um, you know, include uh, the Cincinnati Bengals and the Kansas City Chiefs, who are tied for first at 11 and a half, um, and the Buffalo Bills at 10 and a half. Um, yeah, so excuse me. So yeah, so the Dolphins are tied for fourth there. I thought that was kind of surprising. Um, again, coming off a nine-win season, one in which Tua didn't play four of those games because of a, a two diagnosed concussions. Um, so nine and eight, Tua didn't play four of those games. You add Ty you add Jalen Ramsey um to that defense. You add Vic Vangio, who's reshaping that defense, who expected to be much improved um from its kind of average standing this past season. Um that the AFC, without a doubt, and specifically the AFC East, is no doubt better. Uh, we all expect uh, the Jets and the Packers to, at some point, finish uh, this trade uh, or to finalize uh, the trade that would send Aaron Rodgers to New York, um, which would give the division another top-tier premier quarterback. Um, so I get that. You have the Jaguars, who are up and coming uh, with uh, with Trevor Lawrence. Um, they're adding Cal Calvin Ridley, who's back from suspension. Obviously, the Chargers, uh, Justin Herbert, we know that they're capable of. And there's no there's no there's no question about uh, the the top three: the um, the Chiefs, uh, the Bengals, and the Bills. We know where they stand. But I just found it kind kind of interesting. You know, nine and a half. I think it's kind of definitely. I think kind of like hedging um, and definitely takes into account uh, the, the health risk and health concern about Tua. Last year, the Dolphins were at eight and a half. So if you tell me, and again, that over under win total was probably uh, factoring in Tua's availability as well. Um, but I don't know if, if you're telling me that, you know, if you're telling me that Tua uh, is going to play at least, you know, let's say 14 games, that so to speak, I mean, he missed, he missed four games uh, in 2022. I believe he missed about three or four games um, uh, in 2021. So if you say he's going to play 13, 14 games, um, I really, really do like this team. I think that, you know, in terms of top to bottom talent, I think that they're, they're, they're honestly arguably, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, they're they're amongst the, the top teams in the NFL. I mean, this is a Super Bowl caliber roster. Um, when, when you look at, um, you know, having talent at premier positions, that being wide receiver, cornerback, um, tackle, safety, if you want to throw that in there. And then obviously the quarterback position, um, we, we know and we've seen what Tua can do in a full season in this scheme. I think he's only going to be better in year two. So you give me that, you give me an improved defense, you give me, uh, you know, maybe, you know, maybe an improved special teams, you know, they, they bring in Jake Bailey, who's a couple of years removed from his um, all pro season. I think Braxton Barrios is going to give a lot as a returner. Um, he could give a lot, uh, give some at, 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 on offense, but I think he's really going to add some juice as the first legit returner they, they've had since Jakeem Grant a couple of years ago. So you got an improved off, uh, you know, seemingly hypothetically an improved offense, uh, an improved defense, and even an improved special team. Now, we all know it doesn't always go like that uh, in, in the NFL, um, but on paper, you could say um, that there's reason for all those be, uh, units being improved. On offense, maybe not so much because of the actual talent that they've added, but more so because of the continuity in year two of that system. Um, if, you, if you give me, if you tell me that all that's going to happen, or you hypothetically think that's going to happen, um, and, and you get, you know, I won't say injury luck, but you get 
you get, you know, Tua starting the overwhelming majority of the regular season. Um, the Dolphins will play a tougher schedule because uh, they finished uh, second in the division as opposed to um, third the previous year in 2021. So you get a little bit of a tougher schedule, obviously a tougher division uh, with New York, um, Buffalo being in there and the rest of the AFC. But I don't know. Uh, I think nine and a half, nine and a half is, is, uh, is selling this team short. Um, you know, I saw this as a, you know, nine, 10 win team last year. Um, they definitely exceeded my expectations when Tua was in line on offense. They exceeded my expectations. I think that they're going to be better um, this year. Um, if Tua stays healthy, I think they're definitely going to be better. Um, I really, really do like the, the the floor and the ceiling of this team. I think that this is definitely a double-digit uh, t- uh, team win. Um, I think it's a playoff caliber team um, when, when all things are said and done. But as we've said, you know, several times over the past couple of weeks, past couple of months, you know, really, you know, all season, um, all last season is the availability of Tua. Um, if he can, you know, he, as as the case with a lot of teams, if he is in the lineup, um, he changes the fortunes and the projections of this team. Um, the Dolphins, you know, picked up the fifth year option. They, they've stood by him because they, they, they believed in him. They saw what he did last year. Um, and, and I have no questions about that. I mean, if he's on the field, I think he, he can be, um, you know, an, an elite type quarterback. I think I really think he can. I think we've seen it. Um, it's just a matter of staying on the field. Um, but yeah, I mean, I said it, you know, I was talking to some people before. I think that this is a double digit win team for sure. Um, barring health, not just Tua, but across the board, they got to get, they got to keep the offensive line healthy. Um, their core guys have to stay healthy. Um, if that happens, I think for sure this is a 10 win team, uh, at least. I think this is a team um, that can definitely contend for um, the AFC East crown. Um, and, you know, again, we'll, we'll, I think last year will always kind of be one of those what if seasons um, because we really did see uh, the Dolphins start to hit their stride in, in October and November. And obviously they, they kind of stumbled in December. Um, but if Tua doesn't get that second diagnosed concussion and he's not knocked out, um, I, I do really wonder what they could have done. Cause I think that the offense um, was was clicking, and we know we know the offense's potential at least. And I think the defense, you know, I'll I'll be it, uh, you know, kind of up and down. I think they were starting to kind of come into their own at times. I mean, I think that they they really could have, uh, you know, well, we saw what they did against Buffalo without uh, Tua. So I think that they really could have uh, maybe made some noise if Tua stayed healthy. Um, but you know, that's in the past. Um, the team's looking forward. I think that they made some really really strong moves, not just Jalen Ramsey. Uh, by adding David Long, um, adding Deshaun Elliott, who I think that could, if he's not a starting safety, he could be a nice rotational guy, um, you know, an aggressive big hitter near the line of scrimmage. Um, and, and then obviously you're hoping uh, that some of these young guys uh, step up in terms of, you know, whether it's Liam Eichenberg or, uh, you know, uh, Austin Jackson or whoever the case may be, maybe Shane Tindall steps into a role. Um, you know, they they, they they really have, they, they, they have about it all. I mean, I don't see any glaring, um, roster holes on this team outside of you know that left guard and that right tackle position if and if they can get you know the commensurate play out of those two guys Liam uh Eichenberg and Austin Jackson um I think that you really have a you, you then you have a really really solid offensive line and we saw what Tua did behind a so-so offensive line so just imagine what he can do with a really good offensive line imagine what the running game looks like with a really good offensive line um so all that's to say is nine and a half over under wins. Uh, I really like the over, especially if Tua can stay healthy. Who knows uh, what happens there? Um, but I'm really, really bullish on this team, even more so than last year. I, I thought that they were a fringe playoff team last year. I think that they are a definite playoff team this year. And I think that if all things goes well, goes well, uh, this is definitely a team that can contend for the AFC title. Uh, well. That brings us to the end of another edition of the Dolphins in that podcast. I want to thank you guys as always for tuning in. Um, reminder as always, uh, subscribe to my mirror YouTube page, um, like, share, comment. Um, like I said, things started to kind of die down in the off season. We're kind of past the first favorite free agency. Um, but again, uh, we're still a couple weeks away from the off season workout program, a month away from the NFL draft. We're going to have a ton of content um, on, on both of those um, in the coming weeks. Let's definitely definitely uh, keep your eyes on Miami Herald sports page um, and more. Um, we'll be back next week to recap another week of Dolphins football. But until then, you guys take care. See you.